Welcome to the Men Unplugged Show. Get ready to plug in and recharge your life, family, and career while igniting your faith in Christ. Now, here's your host and champion of helping men live with passion and purpose, Jeff Jarena. Hey, how's it going? Jeff Jarena here, and welcome to episode 46 of the Men Unplugged Show. To make sure you never miss a single podcast or my weekly Facebook Live talks, subscribe to our email list at menunplugged.net. While there, you can listen and subscribe to the show for free on our website, iTunes, or any other podcast platform. You'll also see a list of resources as well as my speaking and training forums that will help you ignite your faith and recharge your life. All right, let's chat with today's featured guest, a member of the Chicago Cubs 2016 World Championship team, Chris Coughlin. Chris, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat, man. Hey, are you ready to plug in and recharge? Absolutely. Chris won the 2009 National League Rookie of the Year with the Florida Marlins, where he made Major League history as the first rookie to have back-to-back 40-hit months. Known as a utility player, he's also played for the Oakland Athletics, Toronto Blue Jays, and back now with the team, he won that World Series with the Chicago Cubs. So, Chris, take a quick minute and fill in any gaps from that intro and a little bit about your personal life. Yeah, Jeff. Um, I don't know if I can do that in a minute because there's a lot of gaps in there. But uh, the best way I'd say it is, um, you know, I've my first year, I got drafted in 2006 with the Florida Marlins before they became the Miami Marlins. Uh, it's been a long journey. Um, you know, being in different organizations, it's been a blessing. Uh, we've traveled everywhere and got to live my dream out. Um, I'm now married and have one son. Uh, his name is judge and my wife's name's Corey and we live in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, actually, this is kind of interesting here because you originally are from the Northeast from Rockville, Maryland, and then you go to mm-hmm. school at Ole Miss. Now that was, was that a little bit of a shock for you? Was it different? I mean, you're obviously the accents are different. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I grew up, I mean, I was born in Rockville, Maryland. My dad, um, you know, he did SWAT yeah. team and worked for Montgomery County police department was forced to retire, getting injured on a SWAT raid. So we moved mm. to Florida when I was nine, grew up in Florida, eventually signed, went to Ole Miss. And the funny story about that is, I thought it was old miss o l d um <laughs> you know the only reason uh I heard of them was because my favorite team at the time, the Florida Gators for football, had just lost to Eli Manning and oh. Ole miss, and so I didn't really hold them in high regard, but the only thing that I knew was that s c c was the best baseball in the country as far as conference and uh college, and so uh it was just a great opportunity went to school, fell in love with it immediately on campus. Um, and, uh, loved my three years there. Uh, it was, it was a wonderful time. Okay. I got to ask you this question here, and I'm sure it's a question that you get asked a lot of times, but how cool was that to win that world series, especially for a team in a city that had waited so long for you guys to bring it back home? What? 108 years. Seriously, Chris, you guys stretched that thing out for all the Cubs fans, seven games and 10 innings. In the final game, how was that feeling? Um, man, that's, I mean, I wish I had a vast enough vocabulary to really describe that emotion. Um, you know, the, just the plan for the organization years prior and just the culmination of um, all the negative thoughts really about the organization, the franchise of, you know, oh, it's the goat and the curse and we're the lovable losers. And you had all of that. So it was just not only enough pressure to win it, plus all the years and the history and people just essentially waiting for you to fail so they can just say, oh, there's the Cubs again. They find a way to blow it. Um, You add all that to the history of uh, playing the Indians. They were the second longest franchise without a World Series. I think theirs was 60 plus years. Mm. You know, we go down 3-1. Um, you know, we lose both the games prior at home and all the pressure and, you know, to come back, we, I remember joking at the time because it was like, oh, now I at least know when to send the U-Haul and, uh, 
uh, packing <laughs> everything up because uh, we're going to go game seven. You know, we just had a confidence about us. And, and sure enough, the rest was history, how it all unfolded. And the best thing that I could just use, if there was one word, I usually just, I just say epic, um, just because it's indescribable. And it was such an epic experience um, with that history being one of 25 people to ever walk the face of the earth that is able to say that they were uh, won a World Series there for that organization. Um, it's a blessing and something that just continues to pay dividends. Well, congratulations and, and to the whole team on that. And I got to ask you right here, when you guys were down 3-1, Chris, were you thinking this is not cool? I mean, you had to have a moment like that. You said you guys didn't doubt it, but something had to creep in, some doubts. Yes, that's human nature. Um, and the reality is, is um, I, I'm just I'm big on mindset and just the power of your mind. Um, and really, when those doubts, it's just like our faith. You know, um, you know, you just got to renew your mind. And so you take those thoughts captive. You realize, okay, what's truthful? We are the most talented team in, in the world, and we knew that, and we proved that throughout the regular season. Now, we had to go prove that, and talent doesn't win championships. It gives you a better opportunity, but doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily win it. And so um, for us, we just it was a great opportunity. And I remember even at the end, we were like, we wouldn't want to win it any other way. We wouldn't mm. want to go game seven. I mean, you're making history here, right? So why don't you just make it the most difficult way possible? <laughs> you blow the lead with the most dominant closer, outside of Mariana Rivera, blow the lead, you go extras, it rains, and, oh, yeah, they're going to blow it, and then we come back and we win. We wouldn't want it any other way. The most challenging adversity, uh, we wouldn't want it any other way. And so um, it just made it uh, all the more special. Well, that reminds me of that verse right there as you're sharing that, James one twelve. blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. I mean, there's like a seven-game trial right there. That is big time. So from that series, Chris, and, and really your whole entire career playing baseball, what are some lessons that you learned on how to approach those big moments? I mean, that's the biggest stage right there for baseball. And what our audience can do to prepare for their big moments in their own lives. Man, uh, I could go into so much detail because, uh, I mean, I'm going to give you the general answer because we don't have enough time for you could spend a whole a whole podcast on just that question um, because it's so much more intentional thought and action than just saying you're going to do whatever. But the, the best example I, I can think of for my career in 2000. Seven, I played in a game called the Futures All-Star Game, and it's held before the MLB All-Star Game every year, and it's the future, quote-unquote, All-Stars of the Minor Leaguers, World versus Americans. Hmm. And um, I was in A-ball at the time, and most of these guys are in double-A, triple-A, I'd already been up and down in the big leagues, like great players, and I just felt so unworthy of being on that stage. We were playing in um, AT&T Ballpark in San Francisco, a beautiful ballpark if anybody's ever been or hadn't been needs to go. Um, it has a triple deck and I'd never played in that big of a stadium where it has three decks and anybody who's ever played baseball understands the difficulty and um, playing in a triple deck and being able to see the ball and different elements. Oh wow! Uh, I was on national television. I'd never played on national television. Um, and you know, you got like, you know, you you have Willie Mays as your bench coach. You got all these guys, oh, wow. legends, right? And I'm just like feeling so unworthy. First pitch of the game or first batter of the game, the guy hits a ground ball to me at second base. It goes between my legs. I hear like 40,000 people go, oh, oh, as it goes between my legs. And I was so embarrassed and so scared and fearful in that moment. Um, all because I let my surroundings get the best of me. Mm. I, I felt disqualified because I had built up everyone, everyone and everything, uh, around me except for myself. And so I remember that day as many people blew up my text and made fun of me and friends and just giving me a hard time. I was like, I'll never let the moment get bigger than myself again, because I refused to play that fearful. And, um, so from that moment on, I remember when I made my big league debut in Denver and triple deck and the ball's flying and I'm playing outfield, never played outfield in my career at that time. 
And I just refused to look up at the stands, refused to look at the scoreboard, stayed engaged the whole time. I remember I came out in like the seventh inning, and I swear it felt like 15 minutes had gone by because I was so locked in. Wow. So I just, I was grateful for that moment of embarrassment. Um, So what I would say to somebody else is whatever you're building, whatever you industry you work for or whatever dream you're trying to accomplish or live in, don't ever let the moment um, get bigger than yourself. And so always whatever you dream or wherever you picture your goals of going, when you picture that picture yourself succeeding in that moment, not getting to that moment and then not knowing what to do in that moment. Wow, I really appreciate that word right there, Chris. I really do. That spoke to me. That is a big, encouraging word. Guys, if you're listening right now, what Chris just said there was there is no moment bigger than you. And especially, and Chris, I know you know this. This is really what you're saying here behind the scenes. There's no moment bigger than you because God is on your side. Yeah, amen. Here's one thing that you said. You never played the outfield before, and I had talked with um, Brett Carroll. He was on, I can't remember the exact episode, great interview, and he played the outfield. And so my question for you is, when you play the outfield, I didn't ask Brett this. I actually didn't think about it. But when you're playing in the outfield at night, is that hard to adjust to the lights? Uh, yeah, it depends. The quick, uh, funny thing is Brett was my teammate that year, my first year. Okay, I was um, thinking so. With the Marlins. And so uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was using a coach's outfielder glove because I had always played infield at that point in my career coming up. And um, I was nervous, and I knew Brett, and I knew he was a really good outfielder. And so I remember asking him so many questions. The hardest thing for me moving infield to outfield was the depth perception. Mm. I had such a hard time being able, because I was so used to being so close to the to the batter right. that being that far away, I could, I had a hard time creating angles in my head to be able to run to. And then the depth perception of where that ball trajectory wise will go. Um, so, and then in the outfield, it makes it more difficult, but the good thing is in the major league ballparks, they have usually great lights in the minor leagues. I think it's even more difficult because okay. the lights in the stadiums aren't as nice. Okay. I want to ask you about this one play here before we move on to the next thing. That, play in Toronto where you leaped over the catcher for the Cardinals, Yadier Molina. Now you were playing with the Blue Jays at the time, but what was going through your head here? I mean, you just at the last second said, man, dude, I got to jump. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, I could, again, I could go into so much detail because it's not like you that easy. Uh, when that, you're in your rounding third, I was, I, um, I was like, I was curious of why he was sending me because of the way the play unfolded behind me. I was like, there's no shot. I'm going to score, but I was just running hard. He kept running. I saw the ball come up the line and anyone who's seen the play, you can see where the ball takes Yachty up the line. So your first thought is I'm going to be out. So I need to, um, you know, run the catcher over. And that used to be your thought embedded in your brain uh, for years, but they made the posy rule is what we call it where he got blown up mm, Buster yeah. Posey in his knee. I was actually on deck in that game when I saw that happen. Oh, but wow. uh, he, um, so then you knew, okay, you don't want to run him over unless he's in the baseline. He was, but then at the last second, he bent down to get the ball. And that's why, again, if you see the play, I start stumbling my last couple steps because I haven't decided what move I'm going to make yet. Right. And it's going too fast, so I'm trying to slow down. And then he goes down, and if anyone who's played football realizes, like, anytime a guy's got shoulder pads too low, like, it's going to be hard for you to run him over. Um, and so I just I felt too exposed going full speed and him being way lower than me that I thought I was going to either break my ribs or shoulder. So I just decided last second, just jump. And then when I'm in the air, I'm just thinking, like, back to my gymnastics days as a kid, I was like, all right, you got to tuck your neck. You, know, <laughs> you can't break your neck here. And so – by the grace of God, I was had enough air and was able to roll and um, just leave some bruises. That's it. Hey, well, hey, that's a happy bruise, though, because you did score. You actually landed on the plate with your hand and tucked over. And when I was watching that, the one thing I saw was his shoulder tapped your one knee to kind of give you a little bit more torque to, t- you know, yeah. to tilt over. You know, I think that was a little bit of nudge there from the Lord saying, hey, he needs some help here. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) So 
Let's uh, talk here real quick about Rockville, Maryland. What was something that you learned growing up? Uh, man, I, there's so many. Uh, one thing I'd say is my dad taught me work ethic. Mm. Um, you know, I think that's the one thing I saw out of my dad was uh, no matter how tired he was, uh, when he came home, night shift, working, uh, he would come home and play with us and throw and take us to the field to hit. I played basketball, shoot hoops, played football. He was a little over the top in football. We'd be running Oklahoma drills in the backyard, fully padded up after practice. Uh, me and my brother doing tackling drills. Uh, so there was an intensity level about that, but I, um, I saw a passion and a work ethic and a discipline, and that's something that I still carry with me today. I really appreciate that. My dad has taught me the same thing about work ethic. I mean, that's what our parents are good for. They do that, and I can appreciate that. So from your time playing baseball, what do you think the biggest lesson that God has taught you, Chris, about yourself? Oh, um, man, that's a good question. Uh, I would say the best, I mean, something I love about this game is how humble, and I hate it. It's a love-hate relationship. It's kind of like the spiritual, right? Um you know, where you're constantly against your flesh, just Mm. just waging war constantly. Um, And I feel like in baseball, it's kind of like that in the sense of love, hate. And um, you fail so much in baseball. It's unlike any other sport. You fail 75, 70% of the time you're a hall of famer. There's nothing else in life that you can fail 70% of the time and be considered the greatest in your industry. That's crazy Um, to me. It is crazy. So that's been a mass amount of adversity. And so I think what it it teaches perseverance, it teaches uh, faith. um, It teaches uh, so many things. And, but I, I think in general, I just am grateful that um, that suffering has caused has, has built up a perseverance. It's built up a patience that I neither one I was born with or had. Um, I had to endure to uh, get those, and um, and I'm just grateful that no matter how I fail in this Christian life, that Jesus' love never changes for me. Where mm-hmm. in baseball, it's all about performance. How you perform is how you're loved. And in the Christian faith, I, I love and I just rejoice, Lord, constantly that, like, Lord, no matter how, how much I fail, your love never changes. And I just praise you uh, for that. A big word right there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, and he sent his only son to save the world, not to condemn it. And he loves us no matter what. If you think you're getting some power tips right now, just wait until our supercharge round where we will be after this quick message. Hey, Men Unplugged Faithful, I hope you'll join me this Wednesday from 12 to 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for our weekly Facebook Live Forum. It's a great way for you to provide your feedback about what we're doing here at Men Unplugged and this week's podcast. Simply go to the Start Here page at menunplugged.net for the link to like or follow our Facebook page. And to help us reach more men for Christ, I hope you'll take the share challenge that one of our listeners came up with. All you do is share our website or any one of our podcasts to at least one person every week. All right, let's continue the conversation with World Series champ, Chris Coughlin. All right, brother, you ready to rock the supercharge round? Yeah, let's roll, man. All right. In your youth, you experienced a tragic loss that had an eternal impact on your life. Can you describe that and how that led to your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Um, Yeah, I mean, the really fast version. My dad died in a car accident when I was 15, um, you know, and uh, Um, my dad was the most important person to me, um, you know, in my life. And uh, I grew up Catholic. A uh, lot of tradition and, um, you know, there just wasn't, I never really established a relationship with Jesus. I knew and believed there was a God, really struggled with who God was because I didn't know him intimately. So I created this picture or image um, of what love looks like based on what I had seen in the world. And I came to the form of thinking 
man, God, if, if you love me as much as you say, how could you allow the most special person in my life to die? Um, mm. And uh, over the years, I had men that stepped in the gap for my father. I was, I'm forever grateful. Heard the gospel many times, just um, didn't want anything to do with it. I was still obviously in love with my sin. Um, you know, and then uh, I had a guy in 2008, Aaron Roberts, who witnessed to me. Um, and that day, you know, uh, God granted me repentance. And um, we were in Starbucks, and I remember him sharing, um, you know, Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Uh, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. And I remember that just penetrating me to the core because. As I hinted earlier, my whole life was built around working and everything in this world preaches. If you if you work hard enough, you can do anything and accomplish anything. Um, You know, you got to earn it. And so I just felt like, man, this free gift of salvation that he's talking about in in heaven, that just seems way too good to be true. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't have to do anything like you. You mean that Jesus has done all the work like. I just feel insignificant to receive this. Like it doesn't even feel true. And I remember feeling, having those talking with them about that. And I remember going, okay, well, how do I receive this? And I remember him sharing Romans 10, nine, Mm -hmm. for by grace, or I mean, um, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And just those scriptures just penetrated me. And I remember um, just surrendering my life to Christ in that Starbucks. And it was St. Patty's Day, and I'm Irish. And back then, it, and I even told the guy straight up, like, hey, I'm going to do this. You know, I knew he had brought a Bible, so I knew he was a Christian. Um, you know, uh, but I was like, I'm going to go to this bar and drink some green beer uh, and get drunk. Uh, St. <laughs> Patty's Day is a big day for me. And uh, then afterwards, he politely and graciously was like, hey, do you want me to come with you? Do things change? And I was like, and this is just glory to God. I remember thinking like, man, I'm not going to go do that. I want to, um, you know, he gave me a Bible. I said, I just want to go home and get to know this Jesus cat. And, mm. um, you know, and that forever, that was the beginning of, uh, my, um, my walk in this journey of living for Christ. Um, so yeah, that, that helped shaped it. Um, so it was a uh, it was a great time a uh, uh, time that I'll never forget and forever grateful for Darren for uh, loving me so much uh, that he shared the gospel with me. Mm. I'm sorry, first of all, to hear about your dad and uh, praise the Lord for your salvation. And and you actually mentioned two verses that I tell people all the time: Ephesians two eight and nine and Romans ten nine. The only thing we have to do that you just said is believe. And you know what, Chris. Your story, and if you're listening right now, your story matters. It matters in heaven, and it matters here to somebody else. What was the best moment, other than that World Series win, what was the best moment in your career? Uh, I would say, um, I mean, you win any award you win or anything that you do. So obviously the World Series is the best. I mean, winning Rookie of the Year was super special. But I, the thing, the year that really resonates with me um, from an individual standpoint was 2014 because of the adversity that I had to overcome that year. I had been non-tendered, which basically means we're, we're not going to pay you. We'll release you before we pay you by the, by the Marlins, who at the year before, we were one of the worst teams in baseball. Um, mm. So you're not wanted by one of the worst teams in baseball that don't look good for you. I signed as a free agent on a minor league deal with the Cubs, um, another bad team at the time. Uh, don't make the team out of camp, which was devastating. Um, I was, it was surprised. Uh, I go to AAA and it's a grind and I'm looking at myself after coming off, you know, two major knee surgeries, uh, a herniated disc in my back. And I'm just not the same athlete. And I'm wondering if this is the end. Um, And I'm only like 20, I don't even know how old I was at the time, maybe 28, somewhere in there. Mm. Um, And uh, I get called up and I'm just coming off the bench here and there. I'm barely the 25th man on the roster. An opening happens and um, 
you know, by the grace of God, I start playing really well and I become uh, an everyday player and I'm leading off for that team and have a great year, which really reestablished myself in the game. Um, and I remember the last game of the year in Milwaukee driving home with my wife and like just crying, um, not bawling, but just crying of joy of like, man, God, I cannot believe the journey that I was on because I knew just like God knew um, what was I was up against and all the odds that were against me of having to reestablish myself where I was in the game. Um, and then to now I'm starting, which I never thought was going to be possible again, uh, and having a really productive year and just rejoicing, knowing that like without the Lord's hand, sovereignly opening those doors, like it was impossible. Um, and so it was just a real great opportunity to grow in my faith and trust in the Lord. And, uh, like anything, you know that all things are possible uh, with Christ. Mm. I tell you, those moments, when you're in those moments like that, they're not always fun. <laughs> they really are. And you and you sit there and you wonder, why are you going through this? And, and maybe, like you said there, it's it's for something bigger. But we don't always know what it is, this side of heaven. We just don't know. And I can relate with that. Yeah. I really can. Um, what is a personal habit or discipline that you feel attributes to your success? Man, uh, I, I think, I think my mindset, I think, I think the Lord, so we're, everyone is shaped and, and molded by, you know, it, their experience, um, things that, that happen to them. Um, you know, and for me, I think, my mindset plays out obviously in a different variety of specific detailed ways. Uh, but just to generalize, I would say that constantly, and I said this earlier, just constantly trying to renew my mind, take my thoughts captive when negativity sets in, when fear comes in, when doubt comes in. Um, one of the biggest things for me I, where Satan truly, really tries to rob me and steal from me is, um, he tries to get, and I bought this lie for years, so it's it's a very hard thing to um, to, to win um, consistently. And then over the years of being conscious about it and being present about it, I'm able to have a lot more victory than I did when I was younger. But that that um, if I surrender and give it all to God, He'll just take it away mm. because that's you know um, that that you must suffer in this Christian faith, you know, and um, you know, and a lot of times I want to just play my own God and, right. uh, which is just a root of pride. Um, thinking I know what's best for my life, not the creator of this universe. <laughs> um, right. so that's where I, I think my, I, I think what helps me is my mindset. I have suffered in this life. I have, you know, in my, in my personal experience, I suffered when I lost my dad, that changed, um, my perspective drastically. And then it also became like, I had, I felt like I was broken. Right. And right. so, you know, it's like, okay, I can't be more broken. Now I can be, you know, losing my wife now, but when I was younger, that was my mindset. Right. I've already been broken. Nothing in this game can break me, make me feel worse, more lonely, um, more fatherless than I did be, you know, at that moment. Hmm. And so I just, I, I created this, Thing before I ever knew the Lord for a long time of, of just, um, I will sacrifice whatever I have to sacrifice in this present time for what I want to achieve in the future. Mm. And at any moment, I have to be willing to do that um, for what I want in the future. So what that meant for me on a practical level was I want to play as long as I can in the major leagues um, and for a variety of reasons. But the reason why um, I have to be able to sacrifice right now in this present moment to play as long as I want. If I'm unwilling to do that, I will not play that as long as I want. And, it's, and it comes down to that. That's it. And so at the end of the day, what do I have to sacrifice? Do I have nutrition? I need to train. Um, you know, I have a son and a wife. I have relationships that I got to manage. How do I manage those? I got to spend less time on watching TV. I got to spend less time on the phone. I don't have a computer. I got to do less time with that so that I can be able to focus my energy at the other places in order to accomplish the goal that I want to accomplish. 
Mm, man, I tell you what, you're reading into episode 42. I talked about cut through the noise to hear God. And that's something, Chris, that I had to learn here over the past couple months. So let me ask another question. What's a blind spot or Achilles heel that you think has a tendency to hold you back? I, I pray all the time for new convictions because I, I fear all the times that I'm sinning and have zero conviction over it. Mm. Um, so I can, I, I don't even know all the blind spots. Uh, but the one that, um, that I constantly, I would say is just fear. And I kind of hit that earlier of like how Satan just because of my mindset, because of the experiences that I had in my life, I allowed certain things to paralyze me for a long time um, through fear. And so fear about the future, um, you know, and it just happens more often than I'd care to even admit. Um, but it, again, like I said, it just all stems from the heart's desire to play God. It's just a lack of faith in Christ's plan for me. So it's a, mm. just a desire to control, uh, thinking I know what's best for my life. Um, you know, and, and even though I know what's truthful, it's like Paul, you know, how he says, I know what's right. I know what's wrong, but yet I still choose wrong. Right. And, and it's just the, the fleshly battle. It's the, um, the spiritual warfare. So it's, it's constantly on my weekdays, I pout and I'm bitter about my situation, no matter how good it is, no matter how bad I'll, I'll pout and be bitter. And I feel like I deserve better or I, this is fair. I'm not getting fair. I'm not getting whatever this is. And on my good days where I'm led by the spirit, I'm just so grateful that God loves me so much. He doesn't always give me what I want. Mm. And, uh, because at the core of it, I told you how prideful and fearful I'm just at the heart. It's just selfish by nature. Right. And so it desires self pleasure, self glory, self things. And so, um, God, God, does, as we know, God doesn't operate that way. Right. And so God constantly is like, Chris, I'm for you. I love you. Trust me. And me constantly, my flesh is in rebellion against that because I'm like, ah, I don't know because of Satan. And so the end thing for me is like, the goal is to re rely on God's provision for today and really just to refuse to worry about tomorrow. As it says in Matthew, do not fear tomorrow for today has enough worry of its own. And mm. so it's just constantly having to renew your mind of that. Realize when Satan puts that fear in there, that's not truthful. That's not from the God that I love and that I serve. Take it captive. And then like, like Jesus did when he, you know, uh, fought Satan is like, use the word of God. And, uh, and that's, that's my battle, but that's where I, I have many struggles. But I would say just um, constantly, I would say fear of the future. Chris, you were preaching right there. Were you guys writing notes on this? You didn't give me the study guide for this, Chris, to hand out before. I mean, that was, you were really hitting that hard. I, those words there were well-spoken. And just thinking for myself here, I battle, we all battle what we want with what God wants. You know, we try to force our will into an eternal will that's already been done, and we can't do that. And guys, I hope that you got something from that in those three minutes that Chris was sharing there. We have to maintain the eternal perspective. What is it that God wants? Not what we want, but what does He want? 2 Corinthians four sixteen through 18. Okay, you're in a bit of a trial right now. You're back on a rehab stint with the Cubs, rehabbing your shoulder. And that, to me, has got to be tough being a pro ball player. What is driving you or motivating you to just push forward? I, I think this is such a good question. I mean, I think this is a question that is for anybody in life. And I mean, that's, I'm not a huge motivational speaker type guy. Uh, because I feel like uh, you could have had you know, me convinced the other way. I thought you were doing a good job. <laughs> well, I think there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely applicable things, no doubt. The, but I think at the end of the day, it, unfortunately, I feel like it happens too often where God's robbed of glory. Yeah. And so that's my struggle, personal struggle, um, personal opinion. Um, and uh, so for me, it's like you have to figure out your why. Right. And in anything. So anytime you're in an adverse situation, what's your why? Um, what's your goal and what's your why? And for me, my whole life, um, 
I had always said the Christian answer, you know, um, do your work unto the Lord, not unto man. Uh, it's for you, God, and your glory. But God, you know, knowing my heart, it's like until I got injured again um, and blew my shoulder out, had to have surgery, had to sign a minor league deal, um, had to grind out again. I've been here in Arizona for three months. Um, you know, it's not ideal, but it's just a great opportunity to grow and trust. Um the Lord. And this year I can honestly say like I am doing it for the Lord and for other reasons beside myself, even though I said, Oh yeah, I'm doing it for my family. Um, for my wife, for my, everyone who's poured into me, I really was doing it because I wanted to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. I set out a goal and I was going to accomplish that goal. Um, you know, uh, any way possible outside of sin. And I was uh, bound to do that. And so when I got hurt again and I signed this deal, I realized there was nothing left for I felt for me personally to accomplish. Mm. Uh, I had won the, a World Series. Um, any other World Series would be great. Trust me, I, I would love to win another one. But it'll, it'll never be as, as monumental as the one that I won in 16 with the boys. Right. Um, you know, personally, there was nothing left for me to accomplish, um, because they're just, the rest was just endless pursuits. And so I was like, you know what? I need to do this for my testimony. I need to do this for my, my son, because the easy thing is to go home and find a new job and retire. The hard thing is to grind this out in 120 degrees here in Arizona, playing with a bunch of 16, 17 year olds. And I'm 33. Whoa. And and I'm playing and I got a shoulder I'm trying to come back from and no one wants to give an opportunity to a guy who's that old in the game. Um, the game is getting younger. So I have a lot of things working against me and I probably wanted to quit about two dozen times. You wow. know, I just had a conversation with my wife that long ago, um, you know, because I had to sit back and rehab. I was like, babe, do you think this is just God just saying this is it? You know, like and. I'm so grateful my wife loves me not to just give me what I want to, where she's like, Chris, this isn't, you know, like you you don't just give up. Like you said, Mm -hmm. you were doing this for this. And until God completely shows you that there's no more and closes that door, I feel like you should keep going. And and to the outside, the world thinks, man, that seems a little bit uh, unempathetic and a little bit mean. But I know my wife, we're so intimate that it's like, man, girl, like you give me strength when I'm right. weak. And, and like I was weak in those moments of wanting to quit, uh, like I said, over two dozen times. And my wife being like, Chris, you have to give it all because I know how you are. You don't want to look up one day and wish you gave more because once you're done playing, you can never get back in it. It's not like a different job where you can just get back in it. You're done. You'll never play another professional game in your life. Um, Absolutely. And so that's a big decision to make, you know, with that much riding on it. And for me, my why is the Lord, my testimony, my wife, my son, so I can, and Lord willing, many more kids. Um, so I can say that, hey, I fought through this. When they want to give up in something that's big to them, I can not only encourage them to stick to their word because you gave your commitment to it, but this is what I did too. Because in order to be a great leader, you got to do it. You got to persevere in that too. So how can I shepherd my kids and tell them and encourage them something that I never even did? And, um, and then all the other people that told me that I couldn't do it um, and that I was done. And I made phone calls asking front office guys for jobs and they'd tell me no. Mm. And it was very humbling because here I am playing nine years in the big leagues, begging for a job and another opportunity. And they're like, you're washed up. No, some of them were respectful. Some of them didn't even call back. And I'm like, it just anything in life to wrap up. This is anything in life. The more you put into it, the harder it is to give up. And I've put a lot into it. And so I, I have weak moments, but at the end of the day, I know my, my core values. I know what I'm doing it. I know my why. Um, I know who I'm doing it for. And therefore I persevere more than I would if I was just doing it for myself. Cause I would have given up if I was doing it just for myself already. Whoa, you were fired up right there. So this <laughs> is something that the Lord is really working on your heart. I mean, this to me, from the way that you were speaking, it's something that's really impacted you, something that you've struggled with. I mean, you just said it, but I can hear it in your tone that it really 
is getting you. And, I, and I'm just going to relate with you on this. This podcast, I love this podcast. I love doing what we're doing here. And it's we're not even tapping into what I think God has in store for it. I really don't. I mean, we're just at the cusp of it. I mean, we keep growing it, but it's not exactly where I'm thinking the Lord's going to take this thing. But it's hard. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And so my wife, like your wife, will say to me when I have those moments, she'll say, no, wait a second. God's given you a big task. If you have a big task, and you know this, Chris, if you have a big task, it takes a lot of big work. And you got to stay the course. So guys, when you're listening right now, you have a big task. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's going back to school. Whatever your big task is, God wants you to see it through. And He will be faithful to get you through that. I mean, I think that was the biggest thing that I got from what you just shared there, Chris, is now when you focus on your effort, leave the results to God, then you can't take the glory. You want to add yeah. anything to that? Amen. Yeah, amen. I mean, you said it, be faithful. I mean, you could sum the whole thing up. It's not our job to figure out why or any of this other stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, God opens and closes doors, um, you know, and, but all we're required as as children is to be faithful with whatever opportunity he gives us. Well, I was going to ask you for a parting tip of wisdom, but I think you just hit it for the last three minutes. That was, unless you want to add some other parting tip of wisdom, because those were powerful words. Yeah, uh, I mean, th- th- you you told me, you asked me this question before, and the, the podcast started, and the one thing I kept, I would normally not try to say anything more because I'd just let it be, um, but I just wanted to hit on my personal, like I told you about fear, that's my personal struggle, right, um, amongst many, but um, what I wanted to really share and leave people is like, I wanted people to understand that um, and be reminded of this truth that, that he has plans for us to prosper. And I don't mean that just in, in a monetary meanings of, uh, although he could do that too, but, um, and, but it, it's not, um, it's, it's to trust him and, and that he's so good. You read throughout the Bible and constantly, um, you get to see how our God operates, mm. uh, the characteristics about God. And so, I always try to encourage people. He knows what's best for us. His plans are greater than our plans. Uh, He's shown himself to be faithful always throughout the Bible. Um, And then even from a worldly point of view, throughout the world's history, the greatest accomplishments or or achievements or greatest impacts have always come from stories of suffering. Always. Mm. It doesn't matter what it is. It's always come from suffer. So, I got this truth from somebody and I remembered it <clears throat> to suffer is, is a means that it just means that you're in the midst of something great in order to do something great or be something great. You have to suffer. So that's just, that just should show you that you're in, that, that you're in the midst of something great, just like obviously Jesus and the greatest accomplishment and defeating death once and for all, um, you know, when he suffered, on the cross uh, mm. for us and the punishment that we deserved and bore our wrath and imputed his righteousness to us. Um, and it's the greatest impact in the world's history um, to redeem mankind. Mm. And so Absolutely. that's what I would probably just summarize uh, to, to try to input even more specifically of what I was saying earlier. That is a great word to end on. To suffer means that you're in the midst of something great. Wow. Chris, Thank you so much for being on the show today. Awesome, awesome job today. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you having me, man. Just keep impacting the kingdom, brother. All right, that wraps up today's podcast. Make sure you check out our website at menunplug.net to get our weekly updates so that you don't miss a single podcast like this where you're getting this valuable wisdom. And don't forget about our weekly Facebook forums every Wednesday, 12 noon Central Standard Time. Who knows, I may have a special guest hop on there every now and then. Until next time, stay plugged in and recharged. God bless. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. There's plenty more to see at menunplugged.net, including key resources and ways to engage with Jeff in his training and speaking forums. 
While there, don't forget to subscribe and receive a free gift. We look forward to you joining us next time here on the Men Unplugged Show. Oh, 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 oh,